All right, so uh, if you know anything about the Honor Guard or anything that we do, uh, everything goes by uh, schedules and itineraries. And when we get to a place, you know, we know what we're doing, when we're doing it. And if we're not, we're the ones running it and we're the ones that set up what it is. So we had an itinerary for this trip that was put together months in advance. And uh, the funny thing was is that as soon as we landed in New York, it was over. The itinerary had been thrown in the garbage because it was doing nothing for us. And uh, what happened was is we landed in New York and we started uh, picking up our bags and we were supposed to make contact with some people in New York. And we got a phone call from a guy named Frank. That's all we knew his name was, was Frank and that he was a New York firefighter. And he insisted that we didn't go to our hotel room and that we went to his place. We didn't know where that was. We didn't know anything about it. We were pretty nervous about uh, you know, deviating from the schedule at all. So we took a ride over in a cab to Queens to where we canceled our uh, hotel room and uh, he took us to his house. He ended up in uh, Far Rockaway in Queens, right off the beach. And his place was probably three doors off the beach. And, uh, and at this point we were thinking to ourselves, wow, this is going to work out. This is pretty cool. So he showed us the accommodations and it was maybe just a tiny little three bedroom uh, uh, house on the beach and we went in there and we sat down and at this point we still had no idea who this guy was all we knew was his name was Frank and uh, he sat down with us we all sat down on the couch it was probably about 4 30 5 o'clock in the afternoon and uh, he said hi my name is Frank Ochoa and he goes and I am a Spartan and we said to him, well, what's a Spartan you know we almost felt embarrassed asking asking and he said uh, I'm one of 40 that made it out of the trade center and we were in awe. We were like, this trip is done for us. You know, if we do nothing else at this point in time, just meeting this individual is enough. Well, he took it a step further. He actually explained to us where he was, and he actually took and put up a video of the World Trade Center and showed us exactly where he was. And the story was that he went into the building with his captain, and uh, his other guys packed out and went up to uh, to up one of the towers and they were in the basement of the or the uh, lobby of the Marriott Hotel and his captain said to him let me make a phone call on this phone bank because none of the cell phones were working and he went over and made a phone call and came back and he asked him he says what do you want to do and at the time Frank had only two years on he was a new guy Frank looked at him and said I don't, what do you mean what do you want me to do I'm a new guy and he said I'm asking you what you want to do because this may be the last decision you make So they masked up, and right about that time, the Marriott, the, one of the towers collapsed. And uh, they were in the Marriott, and they got split in half, and everybody on the left side of the Marriott was killed, and everybody that went up the tower was killed, which left him and his captain and a couple civilians. They saw some light, and they headed up towards that light, and they leaded out all the people that were left alive in that building. They got out, and as they came out, they came right up to the other tower up front, and there was a ladder truck and an engine up there. And they walked right up to it and said, what do you want us to do? And the guys on the, on the truck said, did you guys just come out of that tower? And he said, absolutely. And he said, you guys need to go to rehab right now. And it was two blocks away. And they said, no, we want to go back in. The captain came and said, no, you're going to go to rehab. So they walked down the street two blocks and it couldn't have been, but maybe 20 minutes later, that second tower came down. And when it came down, that engine and that ladder, the ones that you see in all the videos that were crushed and that they dug out and that everybody died. In. So Frank actually tempted fate or tempted death twice. Yeah, so nobody in 9-11 uh, ever wants to talk about what happened. Just like we don't want to hear when we have uh, bad calls that we have. But uh, he literally said, he goes, ask me any questions you want. So we spent that first night not only meeting him, which was a blessing, and not going to the hotel where we were, but actually spending up to 4 o'clock in the morning asking him questions like, why did you go up in there? And, what, were your th what was your thinking when you started entering the towers and uh, how did you make it out and how are you doing and how are the others doing and he was willing to sit and talk to us about everything. Any question we asked, no matter how awkward it seemed, he was willing to answer it and it was the best thing that could ever happen to our honor guard at the beginning of this because this would have been September 10th. So this kind of led up to the services on the 11th and gave us a perspective to put it in, you know, to uh, when we went to the services to what we were going to do and how we were going to present ourselves. So the next morning we all got up and once again I still had my itinerary and I said well we're going to the trade center to uh, perform some services there and Frank said you cannot go to the trade center. And I said why not? And he said well because 
the Trade Center is, is not liked by the firefighters or the police officers. And I, I couldn't believe that he would say that, but he backed that up with the fact that it's all political for them and people are pushing their agendas, congressmen and, and presidents. And then the fact that the, the kids would play in the water at the, uh, at the memorial and that they would put their kids up on the names and take pictures of themselves and they just thought it was totally disrespectful. So I said, well, this is what we're supposed to do and that's what we came here to do. And he said, absolutely not, but I will take you to a place that will be better than that. He said, my station house puts it on. We are the only ones that do it. There's no public, there's no media, it's only firefighters. So we went to uh, Riverside Park where there was a memorial that was erected in 1908 back in the horse-drawn errors. And that's what they use for their memorial, their personal memorial. So we got there in the morning before anything was done. They brought out 343 flags to set up. There wasn't enough guys to set them up, so we thought that we would help. That's what we do. That's what we were there for. So we grabbed a few flags. There's some pictures snapped that you'll see uh, of us putting them up, and we were just so honored just to be there at the right place at the right time doing this. And it actually turned out to be that some of the individuals there were very upset with what we were doing because they take this very personal and they wanted to know what we were doing. Uh, one of the uh, guys, Frank, and some other guys from the 911 uh, Commission and the 911 uh, flag explained to them that by a strange twist of fate, the reason that we were there was because of the shooting with Giffords and Christina Taylor Green and the fact that we had a part in not only running all the ceremonies, but we also got to put a stitch in the 911 flag and that we were there to also not only do this ceremony, but to retire the 911 flag into the museum uh, on the later on that day on the 11th. So at that point, one of the battalion chiefs said, we need you up on the stage with us. And at this point we decided, you know, uh, we don't want to disrespect, we had already been told that, you know, this is a private thing and if they, they want to do this themselves, so we decided to stand in the street. So when we got out to the street to where we were going to stand, we started talking to guys and we realized that there was guys there from France, Austria, and from Australia, and all all around the whole country. There was over 2,000 firefighters there. The streets were blocked off by law enforcement, and that's all that was there. It was impressive. It was nothing but firefighters, no family even, just firefighters in their own private ceremony that they did by themselves. So we spent the rest of the day doing that ceremony. It took about four hours, actually, to get through the reading of the names and the rest of the flag ceremonies where we participated in. And after it was over, we were asked at that point uh, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon if now we wanted to go to the Trade Center. So we were uh, told that we could go to the World Trade Center then at this time because all the ceremonies were done. We happened to run into some fire department uh, that were there from around the country and also from local and we met some guys from uh, Parsinope, uh, New Jersey. And these guys said to us, you know, we'd like to take you down there. We'd like to take you through it and show you everything that we can. And it was just amazing. No matter where you were from in New York, people were just so open. I mean, I don't think you would find that here even in our own uh, local city, state, even our own fire department. I don't know that we would have gone to the lengths that these people did, and it was amazing. So they drove us down to the Trade Center. Um, we uh, took some pictures there. We uh, did some rubbing. I actually ended up finding a family member that died um, on 9-11 who was a firefighter in New York. His name was Michael Thomas Russo, and uh, did a rubbing of that, and then the guys helped me, and it very moving. Uh, I have that and it will stay with me forever. Um, we ended up taking pictures there, seeing the memorials the best that we could, helping people. But the most moving thing that happened to us, and once again, this is not on our itinerary, we just happened to be blessed that all this stuff came our way. A dollar and I were heading out of the uh, memorial and there was an elderly lady who was uh, trying to do a rubbing on one of the names. And if you don't know, there was only one chaplain firefighter who died that day. And he was the first one to die. And we happened to go up and help this lady who was doing the rubbing. And she was doing the crown the wrong way. And we showed her how to lay it down. And we held it for her as she was shaking. And as she rubbed across the front of the name, it said chaplain. And then his name. And uh, Dollar and I almost brought to tears. And it was incredible that we could help her and that we could be there for her. And she said, you know, you guys are so great. New York firefighters are just the best and uh, at that point in time she looked up at our, our badges and, and our uh, patches and she saw that we were from Arizona and she said you guys came all the way up here and she just broke down in tears she goes I can't believe you guys have come up here 
for us. And uh, it was just, it was moving. It was um, one of the best things we did um, at that point in time when we were at the memorial. There, the guys decided to take us to two local establishments, and when I say local establishments, that would be bars, that were right outside of Station 10, which Station 10 was a rock throw to the Trade Center. They lost so many guys because you could literally walk from Station 10 to the Trade Center from where it was. And these two little um, uh, bars that were out there, what they ended up doing was uh, ended up being safe havens for the firefighters that were working on the pile that time. So when the towers came down, these guys would work their 12-hour shifts trying to dig out their brothers. And in the interim, they would go to these balls. Well, the raccoon lounge, and the other one was a wooster. And they would take in the firefighters, and they would feed them and give them coffee. And they would just be a place where they could sit and they could talk to each other and, uh, you know, go over what they were going through. And it was a very moving, and uh, it was like therapy for them. So we, they brought us to these locations, and uh, we had Scott Ellis with us. and. He was the only piper, it seemed like, that was around there in New York, and this guy was just a rock star, and every time we went into places, they wanted him to play. Only thing that we were told when we went into each place was is that they did not want us uh, to play certain songs. So we, we went by that request, and those would have been, you know, memorial songs, and we stayed away from those. But we played, and we were sitting in, uh, in the Wooster, and uh, a gentleman that came up that looked about the size of uh, Brian Loftus and a half, came up to me and said to me, he goes, I need your patch. He goes, you guys came all the way from Arizona to do this for us and we just, we need to have something to commemorate that. He said, I need your patch. I'm gonna staple it up on the wall and you could look on the wall and there were just patches from all different departments, all people that had not only worked on that pile but have come over the years to support New York in their time of need. So I said to him, I said, I don't have a patch, sir. And he said, well, you have two choices. I can rip it off your shirt right now or you can take this knife and cut it off. Luckily, I happened to have a spare patch in my pocket that I had forgotten, and I'd taken and given him that patch. We also gave him a Golden Ranch Honor Guard patch, and you'll see pictures of that, um, where they took and they actually stapled it up on the wall, uh, right next to all the other New York patches, and it was moving. These guys were literally crying, pounding on the floor. The ceilings were real low. They were hitting the ceilings. Uh, they, it was just, it was moving. Uh, they just took care of us like uh, we were one of theirs. So after that, we ended up uh, taking the subway back to Frank's house, and uh, the next day, we ended up going to a couple more memorials. One of them was right there in the Rockaway, where we were at in Queens. And what it was was, and if you look at, you'll see some of the pictures that uh, we have, and it's a big star. And on the star, there's points to on the star, and every point on that star leads to a memorial. You could actually sit there in Rockaway Bay, which was in Queens across the river, and you could look at the star and it pointed directly across to where the Trade Center was. Or you could look at another point of the star and it led to the private memorial that they had in Riverside Park. They were scattered all over the city, and this was a marker of not only where they were, but it was like a, they called it the North Star, and what it was was it was an area for them to remember where each one of these were so that you never forget not only where these memorials were, but why they were there. So from there, we went and visited a few of those memorials that day, uh, took some pictures of them, 
spent some time with Frank and some other guys just getting history of what and what what and why things happened and what had gone on since uh, the tragedy happened on 9-11. You know, this, is, this, this year was the uh, 11th year that they actually uh, were doing services and they were explaining to us how um, when it happened, you know, there was so much outpouring and everybody wanted to give them everything. Not only uh, the government itself, the city, but people were just sending money and everything. And that they were explaining to us that now, 11 years later, they're back in the same place they were. Uh, minimal staffing. They haven't hired in over five years. Um, crazy overtime for the guys are being worked to, to death. Their equipment is failing again. And they're back to the times that they were right before the, uh, the Trade Center uh, collapse happened. So the next day, uh, we got up with Frankie and Frankie said, listen, I'm going to take you to work with me. I'm going to take you to my shift. And uh, we said, where's that? And he said, well, it's down in, in the Bronx. And uh, it's actually one of the most dangerous fire stations in the city. Uh, we'll leave around uh, 2 o'clock because his shift started at 5. He was on the night shift. So we ended up taking, once again, our uh, standard uh, two or three train rides in about two and a half hours to get down to the Bronx. And we walked into the Bronx, and we took some pictures of the station. You'll see uh, pictures of not only uh, the board that they have, because they have a board up there for the ladder and the engine, and on that uh, board, it has what everybody's job is, and all they do is change the names on there each day and each shift. Everybody knows if they're on the can or if they're on the tools or what their job is. We took pictures of the station that you'll see. You'll see their table that we were eating at. Uh, this table is 23 feet long and it houses the logo for the engine and the ladder. We ended up spending the whole 12-hour uh, shift till the next day at that station where we uh, hung out with the guys, got to talk to them more information about what they experienced uh, on 9-11 and how they were involved. They actually have an indoor volleyball court that you'll see pictures of because the station was so bad that they could not leave the station. Once they got to the station, the door closes and they stay inside. They have a backyard that's probably uh, enough to house about five cars. It's got a 10 foot uh, fence with razor wire around it. So you're either out there or you're inside, but you don't go outside at all. It's just not a place that you want to be at. Uh, they have guys that do night watch and what they do is they sit up and like we get our calls here, but they sit and actually have a guy sit in a room and his job is that when that call comes in to pull it off of the printer, push the right buttons to dispatch the right crews. Uh, they have a lot of guys in these stations, nothing like we have here. They have a battalion and a driver, so that's two. You have a ladder truck with six. You have an engine with six. So you can imagine there's quite a few guys in a station, three-story station. It's, uh, it was a little cramped, uh, I had to say, with a, a six in there too. We asked these guys, hey, where would you like us to be? What do you want us to do? We took some videos that you guys will see of uh, sliding down the poles and the poles. Their engines, their ladders, they ended up, the people in the area call them the swines. So uh, instead of uh, you know, just shrieking that off and uh, having to say, oh, I can't believe they're saying about it, they owned it. So they ended up uh, putting the pig on their trucks and then they ended up putting two plastic pigs on the front of the ladder truck too. And they, took, they owned it, they called themselves the swine, just like the people in the area called them. And uh, we spent the rest of that day there. They don't sleep. We, uh, we got there around five o'clock and we said, you know, what time's dinner? And dinner was at 12.30 which I know is late for us. People here at the station freak out when you have dinner later than six o'clock. We ended up eating lasagna the size of your head at 12.30 at night and then went to bed at one. So it was a different world, a different experience. And uh, that was an experience that I can say just topped off everything we had. If you've never been to Yankee Stadium, it's impressive. So uh, once again, we, uh, we got in our full class uniforms, which if you don't know in New York, our class A's, we look like police officers. So every time we get on the subway, it was hilarious because we would be standing together with our badges on and everything heading down there. And the announcer or the, the driver of the uh, subway would say, there's police officers on the uh, subway tonight for your added protection. He had no idea we were, uh, we were uh, firefighters. And luckily we never got called upon to do anything. But we took our two and a half hour regular subway ride down into, um, down into Manhattan to go to the baseball game. And when we got there, we got our seats. And uh, if you don't know, Johnny Miller's, uh, I think it's his uh, uncle, is uh, Joe Girardi. So we got our seats and they, 
welcomed us with open arms and we came in Class A uniforms and we were actually sitting in Joe Girardi's seats, which is about five rows from the bullpen. It was the closest I've ever been to a major baseball game like that. Um, as we sat down, people would welcome us, people would come up to and talk to us. They uh, asked us why we were there. We were able to give them the experience of why we were there and what we were there for. Um, they ended up doing the opening ceremonies and they decided at that point in time that they were going to have no honor guard on the field. It was a personal preference because of the week, uh, so we stayed in our seats. But the nice thing about it was is as we rose for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance when they did have the flag up there and for the singing, they put us up on the Jumbotron uh, two or three times and they actually welcomed us, you'll see pictures of that, to the stadium, you'll see how close we were sitting to the stadium. Uh, it was actually aired on local and uh, national TV and where they thanked uh, Gold Ranch on the Guard for not only uh, what we do, but for coming out there to support them. And uh, once again, you know, you don't realize the, uh, the validity of everything that you do. You know, we say we're going out there to uh, to support them and to honor their fallen. And when we get there, they're so honored that we're there that it's almost uncomfortable. They put it to the point where they sit there and go, "I can't believe you came. I can't believe you did this. I can't believe a small department." like Boulder Ranch would take the time to come out to here to say we're sorry and we're here for you and, uh, and just be in a state of honor for them. And, uh, it was really hard to get by because we were there to do our job and honor them and instead they kept saying to us, thank you so much for being here. Can't believe you came. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, it was moving. Um, at the end of that game, uh, we were uh, escorted out and we had a bunch of people that were just thanking us on the way out, thanking us all the way to the subway, thanking us for the two and a half hour drive all the way back to uh, Rockaway Bay where we were staying with Frankie. And um, when we got there, I have to say that it was uh, it was emotionally and physically exhausting. Uh, it was definitely an honor to be there, but by the end of the trip, I think we were all pretty much, uh, we were done. We were emotionally done, we were physically done, and I think we all look forward to coming back home to be with you guys.